Welcome everyone to the last talk of the day. Uh, we're very happy to have uh, Professor Michael Stoll from the University of Bayreuth. He's going to speak on the conjectural asymptotics for prime orders of points on elliptic curves over number fields. Please start, Professor Stoll. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. Um, so thanks to the organizers for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to give this talk and sorry for not being with you at ICTS. So um, what I'm going to talk about is joint work with Martin Derricks, as you can see on the title slide. So what is this about? Um, so the <clears throat> underlying problem is the following. We fix a degree D, at least one, and then we consider elliptic curves over number fields K of degree D and their torsion subgroups, I mean, torsion subgroup of the point of K original points. And then um, we are interested in the possible isomorphism classes of these finite abelian groups. And this is an old and famous problem and it's very hard. So um, as a first step, we make it simpler by just looking at the prime divisors of the orders of these groups. Um, then of course, if you have a finite abelian group and um, some prime divides its order, then it will have an element of that order. So um, the determination of the prime divisors of the order of these groups is equivalent to the following. Um, and we're looking for the primes P such that, well, there's a number field K of degree D and then and the curve over K and then there's a point a k rational point on this elliptic curve whose order is exactly this prime p, and uh, we denote the set by s of d. That's pretty standard notation by now. And so basically the goal is to, well, to determine s of d or to say something about the set. And by Lorel's famous uniform boundedness result, we know that the orders, these group orders are bounded in terms of the degree, so um, there can be only finitely many possible primes dividing the group order, which means that all these sets S of D are actually finite and then it makes sense to, to ask questions about, I mean, how large are they or what's the largest element and <clears throat> things like that. Okay, so that's the definition of the set S of D again. Um, so then one possible question is just to, to ask what is the set explicitly for the given D and then D had better be small, otherwise it's rather hard to, to do this. Um, there are results in this direction. So here's a list of what is known. Uh, Maser famously proved that the only primes, the only prime orders of points on elliptic curves over Q are two, three, five, and seven. Um, Kamiani did this for quadratic fields. So the primes go up to 13 and then Parent um, did it for cubic fields. We get the same primes. And then in joint work with Martin and Shaden Kamieni and William Stein, um, we determined the next four sets. So S of four, five, six, and seven. Um, and then in the course of the work I'm talking about, but both in a different direction, together with Martin, we also determined S of eight and um, using some, some additional ideas. And there's also another paper by Malia Kravaja who also did this, but using the, the methods that we described in our joint paper with the four authors. Um, so you can see that the 37 in S of six is green. Um, this is because it's sort of a bit different from the other numbers. The black numbers always occur infinitely often. So there are infinitely many elliptic curves, distinct J invariants over various fields of degree K, uh, degree D, sorry, that have odds um, that have points of, of these orders, but 37 is kind of sporadic. So there's essentially just one elliptic curve over a sextic number field with the point of order 37. So it's one question one can ask, but one can of course also consider um, what happens when D gets large and so ask kind of asymptotic questions, um, say give a bound for the elements or try to figure out what the largest element is asymptotically, things like that. And that's um, what I will focus on in this talk today. 
So what, what's the best general result regarding bounds? Um, this is this fairly well known result due to Österle that says that the largest prime order that occurs for a point um, on an elliptic curve over a field of degree D is bounded by, by this. So three to the D half plus one all squared. Um, this is exponential in D as you can see. So it's a bit more than three to the power D. And if you go back to, um, to the list I showed, yeah, then I mean, the growth of these numbers does not look very exponential. So we expect that this exponential bound is actually quite far from the truth. And this is one reason why it's hard to determine the sets for given D because the bound you, you start with is quite large and then you have to exclude lots of primes to get down to what the degree D is. Okay, now, um, the title of this conference is Russian points on modular curves. So we want to relate this problem to Russian points on modular curves. And this goes in the following way. So this is basically the definition of, of the set S of D. If we have a prime in the set, then we have this number field of the degree D. We have an elliptic curve over this number field. And we have a point, the K Russian point on the elliptic curve that has order P. Now, by the definition of the modular curve X1 of P, this means that um, we obtain a point defined over K on X1 of P, so point little x, K should point on X1 of P, um, which is not a cusp because it comes from an actual elliptic curve and a point on it. Now, this is a point that's defined over K. K is a field of degree D over Q. And so this point will have D conjugates. And we can take all these conjugates and take their sum as a divisor, so we'll form a sum. And then what we obtain, so I mean, we can write this as a k, the trace from k down to q of this point x. Um, this is an effective divisor of degree d because we add d points on the curve, x1 of p, and it's q rational because um, the sum of these points is invariant under the Galois action because the Galois action just permutes the points in the sum. And then there's a moduli space for effective devices of degree D on the curve, um, which is the D symmetric power of the curve. And so what we get is the Q rational point on this D symmetric power of X1 of P. And because it comes from an elliptic curve with a point, um, this divisor, I mean, all the, all the points in the divisor are conjugates of, of this one point, so they correspond to elliptic curves. And so none of these points in the support is a cusp. And so turning this around, um, this means that if we can show that every rational point, Q rational point on the D symmetric power of X1 of P must have a cusp in its support, then P is not an element of S of D. Now, so the, the goal is to exclude many primes P, so we state it in this way. So our goal will be to show that for um, suitable D and P, all the rational points in the D symmetric power of X1 of P must have a cusp in their support. <coughs> so to state the main relevant criterion we will use, I need a couple of ingredients. One is the gonality. So here's the definition. Um, we consider a curve, vice curve, so smooth projective, um, and geometrically connected over some field K. And then we can define the K-gonality of, of this curve X, um, which I will write as gon sub K of X, as the smallest possible degree of a function defined over K, um, one constant, obviously, because otherwise the degree is zero and would not be interesting, the minimal possible degree of a non-constant function defined over K on the curve. And then basically, by definition, we have the following fact. So if we have two effective k rational divisors on the curve um, with the same degree, which is less than the gonality, strictly less, and they are linearly equivalent, then they must be e equal. Um, this is just because if, well, if, if they are not equal, then their difference is a divisor of a function, um, which then must have degree, at most the degree of d1, or D2 and so less than the gonality and such a function doesn't exist. 
by definition of regularity. So then um, we know some, some things about the regularity of the curve x1 of p. So for us, the q regularity will be relevant. Um, but in fact, I mean, this bound also holds for the c regularity, so with the complex numbers. Um, and I mean, the, the constant here is not really important. The only thing we need to know is that there are some constants such that the regularity is bounded below by this constant times p squared minus one. Um, and then you can also bound the regularity from above in a similar way, which comes essentially from the riemann roch theorem. So I mean, we have a rational point, rational cusp on x1 of p. And then by riemann roch we can find functions of any degree that's at least as large as the genus, and the genus can be bounded by p squared minus one over 24. Um, so that's not the best possible bound for the gonality. There are slightly better bounds, but what's important for us is that um, really for every degree starting from this, there's a function, and this then implies that there will be infinitely many points of degree d on x1 of p for each degree that's at least the genus. Um, and so translating translating this inequality from um, and then bound for p in terms of d, we get this. Yeah, so this tells us that for, for each degree, um, so fixing p for each degree, that's at least as large as this. That's a function of this degree. And then taking rational points on p1 and their pre-images, we will find lots of points of degree d by Hilbert's irreducibility theorem. In fact, infinitely many. And so we see that well, now fixing d for each prime that's bounded by the square root of 24d plus 1, there will be an infinite family of degree d points on x1 of p. So there will be infinitely many elliptic curves over some field of degree d with a point of order p. So this gives us a lower bound on s of d, which is um, goes like the square root of d. <coughs> and yeah, I mean, since we have bounded the connective from above and from below by um, constant times p squared minus one. So we have pinned down the, the order of growth of this. And um, this tells us that these non sporadic points, so that occur in infinite families, they come from primes that are bounded by some constant times the square root of d, essentially. And so the more interesting question is the question um, of sporadic points. So what can we say about points that, so let's say primes where there only finitely many such points. So another ingredient is Hecke correspondences. Um, I mean, I'm sure everybody knows this, but just for completeness, I've put it on the slide. So we fix two primes, P and L distinct. And then we have the modular curve X1 of P that we already saw. And we also have the curve X0 of L that <clears throat> classifies elliptic curves as cyclic subgroups of order L. And then we can, can combine the two. So basically we take the fiber product over the J line. I call this X10 of P and L. Um, so the points of, on this curve, we classify triples of an elliptic curve, E, the point of order P, and then the cyclic subgroup of order L. And then there are two ways we can uh, map this curve to x1 of p. So one is the obvious one, we just forget c, I mean the cyclic subgroup. So <clears throat> if we take a point that comes from, from an elliptic curve, then it comes from a triple like this, and we can just forget c, and then we get an elliptic curve with a point of order p, so we get a point on x1 of p. But we can also do something slightly different. We can use this cyclic subgroup c to obtain an, an isogenous curve. So that's an isogeny whose kernel is c. <clears throat> And this is the isogenous curve. And then we can map the point P by the isogeny. And they get this. And this will still be a point of order P because P and L are distinct. And so we also get the point in X1 of P. And this gives us a different map from X1, 0, PL to X1 of P. And then we com can combine these two maps. So starting with a point or a device on X1 of P, we can put it back under the first map, which basically means <clears throat> we consider all points EP and then all possible choices of a cyclic subgroup of order L. And then we push it down using beta and then we get again something on X1 of P. 
Um, so this will map divisors to divisors and therefore gives us, gives us an endomorphism of the divisor group on X1 north P, which I denote by TL, usual notation of for Hecker operators. <clears throat> and then this will induce an endomorphism of the Jacobian X, the Jacobian J1 of P of X1 of P by, because it's compatible with linear equivalence. So by going over to linear equivalence classes of degree zero, we get something acting on the Jacobian. And so explicitly, um, if I start with a point, <clears throat> then what this does is the following. As I said, we have to, to take all possible choices of C. So we take sum over all C, subgroups of order L, and then um, we take these points and map them via beta. So we have to take the sum of these points on X1 of P. Okay. So we need some properties of this. So, but before I state that, I also introduce the diamond operators. So <clears throat> if you have an element of the unit group of Z mod PZ, then um, there's an automorphism of X1 of P associated to, to it, which I write in this form. Um, that on, in the modular interpretation just corresponds to multiplying the point by A. I mean, if P is a point of order, P and A is vertical mod P, then A times the point P is again a point of order P, so small p. And so we get an automorphism of the curve, which is compatible with this covering map down to X naught of P because of course P and A times P generate the same <coughs> cyclic subgroup of order P. And now um, we want to consider polynomials in the Hecker operator with coefficients that can also involve diamond operators. So more precisely, I consider a monic polynomial um, with coefficients that are integral linear combinations of these diamond operators for our fixed P. And then I can um, apply this, I can plug in a heck operator TL. So I get a polynomial in TL with coefficients like this, which will, um, because of the diamonds also operate, of course, on the devices because they act on points. This will give me an endomorphism of the divisor group. And then I can consider its kernel. So the devices that are killed by this. And the statement is that um, these divisors must, devices in the kernel must be supported in cusps. That's a theorem that's also in, in this four author paper somewhere. And then another fact we need. So this, this here is an example of such a polynomial. So it's monic of degree one and it's constant term is a linear combination of diamond operators, L times diamond L minus one times <coughs> the trivial operator, diamond one, if you like. Um, and yeah, it's a fact that if L is an odd prime different from P, then this operator, if I consider it as an endomorphism of the Jacobian, this will kill the rational torsion subgroup on J1 of P. So now I'm combining these things um, to obtain the following statement. We start with the prime, P at least five, we fix a degree D as usual, we consider a rational point on the symmetric power of X1 of P. Um, remember these are the points of which we want to show that they have to contain the cusp in, in their support. Then I fixed such an A, so the diamond operator. And then I can consider the, the operator acting as a difference of the diamond operator A minus the identity on um, the Jacobian of, of X1 of P and then on the body there group. And what I need for this is that if I act by this difference on the model there group, um, this kills the free part. So I end up in the torsion subgroup. The dagger is just here to, to be able to refer to this assumption later. And then the statement is that if the degree is not too large compared to the gonality of X1 of P, then it follows that <clears throat> this point X, which is a divisor, effective divisor of degree D on X1 of P must actually be a sum of cusps plus a divisor that's fixed by his diamond operator A. So here's a sketch of a proof. Um, we fix, I mean, X1 of P has a bunch of rational cusps. So we fix one of them and call it C. It's a rational point. 
And then um, because X has degree D, if, if we subtract D times the social cusp, we get a rational divisor defined over Q of degree zero and its linear equivalence class will therefore be a rational point <clears throat> on the Jacobian of X1 of P. Now, by the manning dinfeld theorem, um, a difference of two cusps is torsion. So if I apply diamond minus one, diamond A minus one to the linear equivalence class of the cusp C, then I get a divisor class represented by a difference of two cusps, um, which will be zero, uh, which will be torsion. And um, since C is rational, this is a rational torsion point. And then taking, um, using this dagger applied to, to this point and adding D times this relation to it, we see that if I act by diamond A minus one on the point X as a divisor, then this also has to be torsion. And then um, we use this, this Aifashimura statement that <clears throat> an operator of this form, if the prime three here is odd and different from P, and that's why we assume that P is at least five, so three satisfies these assumptions. If we apply this then to a torsion point, then we get zero. So this kills the torsion. So the whole thing is zero as a point on the Jacobian. Um, now we can expand this, this product here and write it as a difference of two effective things. And then we obtain a linear equivalence of this form. So, I mean, we get sort of the, the positive terms here, T3, T3 times the diamond A, and then we get plus three times diamond three plus, plus one here, and the negative terms are put on the other side. So now, um, if you think back to the definition of the Hecker operator, then you see that um, the Hecker operator TL multiplies degrees by L plus one because that's the number of distinct cyclic subgroups, cyclic subgroups of all the L they can pick on the elliptic curve. So that's the number of pre images under the first map alpha they have to take. So <clears throat> T3 multiplies degrees by four. The diamond operators um, act on points, so they don't change the degrees. Multiplication by three multiplies, multiplies the degree by three, of course. And then he, he has another one here. So the whole thing multiplies the degree by eight on both sides. So we get the linear equivalence of divisors, effective divisors, because everything here is positive, of degree eight times D. And then because of this assumption on the gonality, so eight times D is less than the gonality. And the simple fact about gonalities, um, this implies that this linear equivalence here is actually an, an equality of divisors. And then sort of performing the same computation backwards, we get back to this again, but now instead of a linear equivalence class, I'm actually considering a divisor here. So that's a stronger statement. Um, and yeah, then, In the previous theorem, it follows that this divisor must be supported in cusps. And so, well, X will may have some, some cusps in the support, so we can write it as a sum of cusps plus something else. The cusps are okay here, but um, the something else, if I apply diamond A minus one to it, will not give me cusps. And so, um, if this is to be supported in cusps, the one cusp of the part has to go to zero. And so, this part um, <clears throat> will have the property that diamond A minus one applied to X is zero. Was just so, uh, uh, no, uh, so there was a, a slight uh, disruption in the connection here. So can you please go back to the uh, implication where, you know, there is 8D less than uh, the gonality number. So after that, can you please explain? This one? Yeah, yeah, after that. Okay, <clears throat> sorry, yeah. Um, so here we have this linear equivalence of two divisors which have degree eight times D because this operator multiplies degree by four plus three plus one. So we have two linearly equivalent effective divisors of degree eight D, but eight times D is less than the gonality by assumption. And so by this simple fact coming from the definition of the gonality, we know that this divisor 
um, the, this linear equivalence has to be an equality of divisors. And then we can <coughs> um, do the computation backwards and um, get this equation, but now with the linear equivalence class of x replaced by x, the divisor x. So we get this equation of divisors, quality of divisors. And then <coughs> from this, we see that this part here, which is diamond A applied to x minus x, is in the kernel of this. And then by the previous theorem, this kernel consists of divisors that support that are supported in cusps. So this difference is supported in cusps. And this implies that, well, any non cuspidal part of the divisor x must be fixed by, by the diamond operator A because it has to go to zero under this map. OK. And <clears throat> as a little bit of small print, um, in some cases, one can replace eight by something smaller, but that's not important for the purposes of this talk where you think about asymptotics, but if you really want to use this to, to prove something concrete for some specific prime P and degree D, then this can help. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm just, I've just erased the proof. Um, so now if we assume that our point X does not have custom support, then um, <clears throat> it follows that it's fixed by, by this diamond A. And if in addition, we can take A to be a generator, so primitive root mod P, generator of this uh, multiplicative group of Z mod PZ, which is cyclic, then um, divisor is fixed by the diamond operator A if and only if um, it's, it arises by pullback from, from X naught of P. Yeah, because all, say, <clears throat> all the primitives of some point on X naught of P are um, they form one orbit under this <clears throat> diamond operator A. The set theoretic pullbacks, um, because of course, if I have a modification, then I don't take don't have to take multiplicities to get something that's stable under A. Now, um, so the this map from X one of P to X naught of P has degree P minus one over two. So generically, such a pullback will be the divisor of degree P minus P minus one over two. There can be ramification, so there, there can be ramification of degree two when the prime is one mod four, and we have a point corresponding to an elliptic curve with J invariant 1728. And then <clears throat> we have to, to take half, half of the covering degree. And there can be ramification of degree three if the prime is one mod six, and we have a point corresponding to an elliptic curve with J invariant zero. And we have to divide the degree by three, so we get P minus one over six. Um, on the other hand, there are no Q rational points in X out of P with these J invariants um, because the two, the two cyclic subgroups of order P, um, I mean, there are two cyclic subgroups of order P that are defined over the CM field, so a quadratic extension. So we get points of degree two, and then there are the other ones that give even larger degrees, which means that <clears throat> to get something of degree D over Q again, we have to multiply these, these two degrees by two. And so we get P minus one over two or P minus one over three. And then um, turning this around, sort of <clears throat> writing P in terms of the degree, we get um, that P is three times the degree plus one in, in this case. And <clears throat> P is two times the degree plus one in this case, in which case D must be even but also in, in this case here. And yeah, so we get actually get these points when, when P satisfies its congruences because then there actually are these points of degree two corresponding to these elliptic curves on X naught of P. So now when does this condition hold? The condition on the condality we had in this theorem. Um, well, I mean, the, we have a lower bound on the condality in terms of p squared minus one and um, sort of solving this for p, this inequality, we get that this holds when p is larger than some constant times squared of d essentially, so squared of constant times d plus one. Um, and we can work out what, what the constant is that works here from the explicit value of the constant in here in this abramovich kim Sarnak theorem I showed you earlier. So when D is large, then um, this condensity thing um, 
will apply when when d is when, when p is linear in d because then you're in, in this range and we can figure out how large d has to be for this then so if if, if we have a prime p in s of d and d is reasonably large and we have we can pick such an a um satisfying the assumption in the theorem then it follows that um, <clears throat> p must be bounded by 2d plus 1 except when d is even then p can meet 3d plus 1. and so we get a nice linear upper bound um but we have this condition on on a and so we have to think about um <clears throat> how likely it is that this condition holds Yeah, so here I give a name to primes such that the condition fails. So I call such a prime P strange. So the condition was that if I apply diamond diamond A minus one to the model Bay group, then um, I get tolling. And so if it's not the case, then this has positive rank for, for generator A, and then it doesn't matter which generator we take of the multiplicative group. And now I want to translate this into a statement that I can check computationally to, to be able to get some feeling of how likely this is. And so, yeah, first point is um, because I have this covering map from X1P to X0P, the Jacobian of X1P, so J1P, um, splits up to isogeny as a product where one of the factors is the Jacobian of X0P, and then I have a bunch of further simple abelian varieties showing up there defined over Q. Um, and yeah, when I take a generator, so primitive root, and I look at this diamond operator A minus one um, acting on J1 of P, then this has the effect of killing exactly the strain out of P part because it fixes, I mean, it sort of it generates the Galois group of, of the covering. And so what remains are just these, these other simple factors. And so saying that this thing here has positive rank means that the model value of one of these must have positive rank. Yeah, so P is strange if and only if the model value rank of one of these things is positive, strictly positive. Now, um, each of these simple abelian varieties is associated to a Galois orbit of new forms, so Hecke eigenforms. I mean, the word new is not important here because the level is prime, so there's nothing old anyway. But um, so there's a Galois orbit of, of Hecke eigenforms um, of level P, so for gamma 1P with some character. And this character is non trivial because these are, the, this is the part that does not come from, from J0 of P. And then by I mean, so first Philip and Dyer <coughs> conjecture related results due to Kulivag and Lugachev and then, and then Kato, so the first for J naught and then Kato extends to J1. Um, this means that the, the L function of, of such an F um, has to vanish at one. And usually this result is stated the other way around. So if the L function does not vanish, it implies that the billion variety has model value rank zero, <coughs> or of course, um, we can also take the quantum positive. And so if if we have this, then um, there must be such a such a new form of level P, V2, non-trivial character, such that the L function associated to it vanishes at one. And this is actually something one can check by computation using modular symbols. So say magma or I guess also sage have um functionality for, for doing that. And um, so we, we can do some computations and figure out what the strange primes are, at least up to some bound. And yeah, then, I mean, I, I can sort of count, say, let's call it such a new form strange if it satisfies this condition. And then I can count these strange new forms um, of level P and I call the number, the kind of strangeness dimension of P this is the same as the, <clears throat> the sum of the dimensions of these factors here that have positive model varying. Okay, so yeah, we can we can um, 
to the computation. And so here I have to thank Joe Sutherland for help with this. So who is responsible for the results for, <clears throat> and, and, I mean, the, the computations for primes between 50,000 or up to 100,000. I mean, also the computations up to 50,000, but um, without him, so the part of the table starting here would not exist. So, yeah, so this gives the primes that are strange um, together with the order or orders of the characters <clears throat> that are associated to these strange new forms and the strangeness dimension. Um, the green numbers are just the, the smallest primes larger than a multiple of 10,000. So to give some, some indication of how the distribution of, of these primes is. So uh, up to here, the first but quite three rows are the primes below 10,000. And then there's one row of primes between 10 and 20,000 and a little bit less than one between 20 and 30,000 and so on. There's just one prime between 17 and 80,000 and just one between 90,000 and 100,000. Um, and then the red numbers are, so for the, the characters that are kind of character orders that are unusual, there's one case where we have order 30, one where we have 14 and one where we have seven. And then <clears throat> everything else is, um, as you can see here, two, three, four, six, 10 or 12. The red dimensions are the largest ones that show up. So we have eight here, we have eight here. So this is the only prime where we have found um, sort of two different Galois orbits of strange new forms. So each of um, each orbit of size four, so we get eight in total, and then we have three more cases where the dimension is six, and then all other cases it's either two or four. So, yeah, looking at this table, one one can come up with a number of conjectures, and um, it certainly looks plausible that this dimension here is bounded uniformly, yeah, I mean, starting from, from 10,000, um, the only dimensions we ever see are two or four. So that would be very surprising to, to see something much larger than that later on. Um, and so, yeah, so that's a conjecture one can make. And um, doing so, so I will make this conjecture a bit later, but um, if we, if you fix a bound on, on this strangeness dimension, so <clears throat> the dimension of, of the part of J1 of P that does not come from J0 of P that has positive modulus A rank, then one can do similar arguments and um, get the same results. Assuming that <clears throat> D is sufficiently large and how large will then depend on S, I mean, exponentially in fact, but for fixing S there will be a bound on D such that when D is larger than this, um, the previous results are still okay. So why is this? Um, so here's a sketch. So previously, <clears throat> the idea was to, well, we take the diamond operator A minus one to kill the free part of the model Bay group. And then we take this, this polynomial in, in T3 to, to kill the torsion. And then we get something, we get zero and then from this, we could draw conclusions, assuming that the degree of this, this operator that we are looking at is times, times D is less than the quantity. Now here, if we do the second, uh, this is operator minus one thing, um, we don't kill off the free part of the model value group completely. We're still left with these um, factors AJ of positive model A rank. And so we need to kill off these. Well, this can be done. Um, so, I mean, each of them corresponds to, to a bunch of new forms. And um, so if we can look at the heck operator T2 acting on them. Um, so we will have certain eigenvalues under T2, which are bounded by twice square root of two. Um, and so the, if I take <clears throat> the polynomial whose roots are all these eigenvalues, which will have degree at most S, then this polynomial will kill all these, these um, new forms associated to one of these factors. And this implies that this 
tech operator that I get when I plug it into this polynomial um, will, call, will, will kill this, this factor aj. And so what we do is we construct this polynomial f of degree at most s, so degree at most the strangest dimension, um, whose roots are all the Hecke eigenvalues under T2 of, of these new forms occurring. Um, we can bound the coefficients because we can bound the, the eigenvalues by twice square root of two. And then we get this polynomial of bounded degree and bounded coefficients. If we use this to act on, on this part, then this will kill the free part. We get torsion and then we multiply by the other polynomial as before. And um, <clears throat> then do the same argument. Only in this case, we also have to, to expand this factor. And so, I mean, this will have some degree which by which we multiply everything. Um, <clears throat> and so the number eight gets replaced by something much larger that depends on S, but only on S. And then the same argument works. So in particular, for, for these sufficiently large D, um, and primes um, satisfying the corresponding gonality bound, it still follows that if you have a point of degree D on X1 of P, that's not a cusp, that um, it must arise as a pullback from X1 of P of a point of degree D divided by whatever the, the degree there is. Okay, and now, now this is the conjecture. So if we assume that these dimensions are uniformly bounded and from, from the table it looks like at least asymptotically four could be the correct bound, or I mean, one could weaken this a little bit and, and require that we have a bound that is not constant, but goes very slowly, say like the logarithm of P or something, that would still be okay. Then, um, from what I explained, it follows that for T sufficiently large, the maximum of, of the set S of these so the largest prime for which there exists a point of order P on the elliptic curve over number field of degree, of degree D, these primes are bounded by three times D plus one. Okay, now um, we can of course ask whether we can do even better. So the game I've been playing was um, using the diamond operators on J1 um, to, to kill the part that comes from J0. And then we've been looking at the, the remaining parts corresponding to these non-trivial characters. Um, now we can ask, I mean, yeah, so we reduce basically the problem of points on X1 of P to points of on X, X0 of P. And then we can ask, can we do something similar on X0 of P? So what we don't have diamond operators anymore because of course they, they are trivial on X and of P, but we do have something and that's the, the Frick involution or Escadena involution, WP, that acts on um, X naught of P and then also on J naught of P. And we know that, and there are only, only new forms associated to of level P and trivial characters, so new form of A2 for gamma naught P. Um, and we know that the negative and it acts on new forms by plus or minus one. And we know that the negative of this, this eigenvalue is corresponds to the, is the root number of the L function. So corresponds to the parity of the order of vanishing. Um, so we have the, the plus quotient. So if you divide the action of WP out, then we get the curve X naught P plus and um, it's Jacobian splits into of the isogeny product of the varieties corresponding to the new forms on which um, the Frick involution acts trivially, which means that the L functions have uh, vanished to odd order at one. And then we have <clears throat> the minus part on the Jacobian um, that splits into the isogeny product of the Abelian varieties corresponding to the new forms um, there the evolution X with minus sign. And then the L functions vanish to an even order at one. So they don't a priori have a good reason to, to vanish at all. And so <clears throat> we, we expect that most of them will not vanish. And then again, this implies that 
the model vector group of the corresponding abelian variety as rank zero. And then we can look at the exceptions. So such new forms with negative that can deny eigenvalue whose L function does vanish um, and do similar things. If there's, um, if there's interest in time, I can show a table, which is not on the slides, but um, I mean, it's, it's roughly similar. You get a bit more primes. Um, so density seems to be a bit higher, but it also looks like the number of such new forms seems to be um, uniformly bounded for all primes P. And uh, so that's, that's the con conjecture I've stated here. There's a uniform bound on the number of new forms um, of A2 for gamma naught P from, from prime level with negative Fricke eigenvalue and such that the L function vanishes at one. And then we, we can do something, something similar and conclude that when um, D is sufficiently large and um, they have some, some connectivity relation, then the points on X naught of P actually have to, to come from points in X naught of P plus. And now if you combine these two things, what we obtain is the following statement. So assuming both conjectures, then um, there are some constants, positive constant C here, such that when D is large enough, um, we can bound the set by, so we get something bounded by the square root of D, which is related to this to these um, infinite families of points and so non-sporadic points. And then when D is odd, so here, yeah, if, we, if we have a point on X naught of P and we know it has, has to come from some so from a point on X naught of P plus and this degree is odd, then this is only possible because the, the covering has degree two. But this is only possible when it comes, when it's a fixed point of, of the um, Fricke involution. And this means that it has to come from a CM point and a very specific CM point. And so <clears throat> this, leads to, to this point bound here. So we can get primes of the form twice D divided by M, where M is a divisor of D plus one. I mean, this has to be prime, so it better be odd. So M has to divide D and, and the two cannot be canceled. And M also has to be the class number of the order of one of these two discriminants. Um, this comes from the fact that you need to have the square root of minus P in there. And um, so this is when D is odd. So this is quite precise. When D is even, um, we, we only get this. So we can have 3D plus one, we can have 2D plus one, and um, we will have these 3D plus one when, when this is prime and 2D plus one when this is prime. And we can also have um, <clears throat> primes of this form. I mean, if this is a prime some divisor of, of D plus one, basically. And so in particular, this then would imply, I mean, always assuming these conjectures that, well, I mean, 3D plus one is a bound, as in particularly, so for, for a large enough D. And so in particular, if I take, well, D even, so D is 2N here. In the even case, um, if I take the maximum divide by the degree, I get three because it will be 3 plus 1 divided by D um, for infinitely many D because there are infinitely many primes congruent to 1 mod 6. And if I restrict to odd degrees, then um, this dim sub is 0. So the growth is actually below linear. And this is because there are only finally many um, discriminants with given class numbers. So if you fix M, then D cannot and D is bounded. And so um, as D gets large, the, div the devices of, of D also have to get large. And so <clears throat> um, if I divide by D, things tend to zero. Okay, yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions, comments?
Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very, very nice talk. Um, I had a question for the conjecture, uh, the last slide, uh, maybe. Oh, yes. Um, <clears throat> have you tried maybe uh, for as a working conjecture, uh, finding a formulation, uh, I mean, an explicit one uh, that would prove uh, that me would be uh, applicable afterwards? I mean, which kind of bound would work uh, in the worst case for the number of new forms like this? Um, I'm not sure I understand what you're after. I mean, are you asking for a concrete bound, a concrete number here, or? An asymptotics for the number of new forms of weight two like this, uh, for gamma not of p. Uh, which number, uh, I guess uniform would be too much to ask possibly, but which number would be enough to run the, to um, run the it's some, something like um, constant times logarithm of p or so should be enough to, to get close to this. I mean, you probably get something a little bit larger here. I mean, you get the, the non sporting points and then you get some gray area where you could have something. Um, but if, if the bound goes sufficiently slowly, then um, would still have this, you, yeah, you basically still get these conclusions down here. So you get this linear bound on, on the primes in the set. So I, I haven't thought very precisely what, what you can, it's a kind of what, what the worst <clears throat> kind of bound is that you can still use, but um, I would think it's, it should not go much, much faster than logarithmic or so for, for this to, to work, or maybe very small power of P, but I'm not sure if this is enough. I mean, I can maybe, um, show you, so let me share another window. Okay, I have to, <laughs> sorry. Um, Because I have one Zoom window full screen, and what I want is behind that one, and I don't. So, is there some key combination that allows me to uh, minimize the full screen window? This tape doesn't seem to work. Let's see if I can full screen here and then. So full screen, um, okay, yeah, sorry about this. Um, well, maybe let me try again, but. Oh, no, okay, let me see this one. So, so you should see this. this yes, table. We, can, we can see it, yeah. Um, so these are the, the primes that are sort of strange in this other sense. And the, the, so the dimension of, of the positive rank abelian part, abelian variety part that's sort of in the minus part of, of, of the freaking evolution. And so you can see that, uh, so it's, Goes only up to ten thousand here. Um, not quite a few more primes, but um, the dimensions in the table are fairly small. So there's oops, there's a four here in, in a few places, and um, we've, we've extended the computation and found a few larger ones. I think five and six. Um, so it's not maybe from from the from the experimental data. It's not so clear whether it's, it should be uniformly bounded, but in any case, I mean, if it goes, then apparently it, it only goes quite slowly. It's, it's maybe less convincing than the other one um, there. Um, it looks like the primes get thinner and thinner. And um, <clears throat> from, from one point on there, there are only a few kind of patterns one sees, but um, I mean, still, it still looks like it should go only very slowly. Just a quick question on the table. Uh, for the um, for the ones with dimension three and four, 
are there simple factors or do they all split these ones um i think if i remember correctly so i, I have i have this information somewhere but um i i'm probably not be able to <laughs> to find it quickly enough if i remember correctly then um kind of both occurs so of course a large number of these comes from elliptic curves of, of like two or maybe four, um, but there are also some some larger ones. But I mean, they, they don't get very large. I mean, yeah, maybe dimension two, maybe dimension three. I, I would have to to check. Um, but yeah, I think if, if I remember correctly, most of them actually come from elliptic curves. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, hello, Loïc Mirel here. Uh, thank you very much. This is fascinating. <clears throat> um, I have a question about the last conjecture. Um, can you speak more into the microphone? Okay, can, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so, so about the last conjecture. Um, yeah, okay, so maybe I try to go. Okay, back the, the, to... it doesn't, doesn't matter. So this is a conjecture <laughs> for J naught, J naught of P. Yeah, and and uh, um, I think there are conjectures of uh, Katz and Sarnak and perhaps Ivanich about uh, the dimension. I mean, the number of sort of uh, dimension of the abelian variety, and and um, um, definitely at at some point um, there there was. Uh, I think it was Katz and Ivanich. No, I'm sorry, Sarnak and Ivanich. And they, they conjecture that um, the dimension of um, the wrong zero part of J minus, J zero of P minus is half at least the dimension, uh, is strictly more than half, 51% of the dimension of a J naught of P mm -hmm. minus. And, and and so, but they couldn't prove it. <laughs> and, and this would have major implications for uh, Ziegel zeros of the Riemann zeta function, uh, if I mm -hmm. if I recall well. Okay, so that's definitely a question which has been considered. And I wonder if uh, there, there are certain estimates of um, Katz and Sarnak uh, for the dimension of uh, this space of, um, new forms such that L of F1 is equal to zero. So I wonder whether, whether you, have look at, you have looked at those estimates. Um, I should, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, I mean, this conjecture is much stronger than saying it's less than, less than half or so. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I think yeah. there's, there's also this the expectation that um, most of the plus part and most of the minus part, um, say, if you, yeah, if speaking of, of new forms, should just be one large Galois orbit. And then um, if one would be able to, to show something in this direction, and also one knows that the rank zero part is at least a half or so, then um, the, the large thing would not, could not, but would, would have to, to have rank zero. And so then, then one could perhaps say something in this direction, but I, I mean, that's, that's two other conjectures, I guess, that one would have to prove first. So this is, yeah, I mean, conjecture like this is certainly supported by, by experimental computations, but um, I'm pretty sure that it's very hard to, to prove anything. Any more questions? Comments? If there is none, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you, Professor Stoll. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Have a nice conference. Yeah. So, I just have a request. Will it be uh, possible for you to share the uh, 
uh, the presentation with the organizers so that we can again uh, share it with the participants here. Yes, of course. So <clears throat> I, I can send you the PDF. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yep. You're welcome. Bye bye. -bye.